Hello, everybody. So nice to see you guys coming in. Um, welcome to our virtual shadowing session today. I'm just going to go over a quick startup presentation to welcome everybody and introduce you to our program if you haven't previously attended one of our shadowing sessions. So pre-health shadowing is a student-led, minority-led, women-led nonprofit dedicated to helping prospective healthcare professionals gain access to educational resources, no matter their demographic status, abilities, or location. My name is Ali. I am the Assistant Chief Volunteer Coordinator here at Free Health Shadowing. Thank you all for attending today and let's get started. Just a quick PSA, we do have closed captioning for all of our sessions to accommodate all students. The setting is available on the bottom of your Zoom screen. And if you need assistance enabling the transcript, go ahead and direct message me or one of my other team members. We're always looking for ways to be more inclusive and ensure our sessions are accessible to everyone. So please, if you have recommendations for how we can improve, you can email us at info at prehealthshadowing.com. Since this is an international program, we'd love to know where you're Zooming from today. And if everyone wants to go ahead and drop just a quick bio in the chat um, and introduce yourself, um, you know, where you are in school, what you're interested in, and where you are calling from, we'd love to see where all of our students are coming from today. If you want to stay in the loop, you can follow us on social media. We're very active on Instagram and TikTok, and you can also sign up for our email list on our website so that you never miss a session. We have uh, a few wonderful opportunities um, for you as being part of our program. So we have partnered with Kaplan to get our students a 10% discount code that can be used on all Kaplan products, as well as free resources like study guides to help prepare you for standardized tests. If you fill out our shirts survey in the chat, we will get it. Um, you signed up for these deals for free. We'd also like to draw your attention to another amazing program called Neolith. Neolith is an online mental health platform for students. For pre-op professionals especially, we know that this path is not easy and that's why we've partnered with Neolith to spread the word and offer free access to their services if you use our link in the chat or enter the code prehealth when signing up. Mask for Mask is an amazing women-led organization that donates four masks for every four masks sold. These go to people in need during COVID-19 pandemic, those in the homeless community, healthcare workers without proper PPE, and others who are struggling to stay safe. With our discount code PHS15, you can get 15% off your order. If you buy through this method, pre-health shadowing will also get 10% of the proceeds, which is amazing because we are a nonprofit that runs solely off the support of our community. If you want to play a bigger part in supporting PHS, we would love for you to join our network of student volunteers and team members. You can apply to be a part of our administrative team and lead students in various projects and initiatives with professional outreach, grant writing, and more. We understand that as pre-health students, you may not have the time. So we also offer the opportunity to volunteer asynchronously with tasks that can be done on your own time. We would love to have you be a part of this program and contribute your own unique perspective. If you're a high school student and you wanna get involved, we've started a program called HTP, High School Training for PHS, which allows you to connect with college pre-health programs, get involved in fundraising for PHS, and organize resources for other high school students interested in medicine through pre-health shadowing. We want to recognize the hard work of all of our students in the program. So if you're interested in getting published, you can submit essays, reflections, research papers, and reviews to our editor-in-chief through the link dropped in the chat to have your work on our website. This will look great on CVs, applications, resumes, et cetera. So take advantage of this. Part of our mission at PHS is to promote diversity. And in order to do this, we have launched an initiative to have monthly panels to celebrate different demographics in the field of medicine. Some of these upcoming events include a series on patient experiences, a COVID-19 roundtable, and an international student forum. If you have a mentor, professor, or professional that has inspired you, and you think that they could contribute to these conversations, please nominate them today using the link in the chat. If you can, we humbly ask that you donate to our program. 
As you know, pre-health shadowing is completely student run and we are looking, working around the clock to keep this free and accessible to everyone. Unfortunately, Zoom and our website are not free, so any contribution you can give would be greatly appreciated. If you're not financially able, we request that you send this link to someone that you think can donate so we can continue to support those who can't afford similar opportunities. Throughout the session today, we encourage you to drop any questions you have for the speaker in the chat. Our team members will be making note of these questions to be asked in the latter half of the session. Take good notes as our professional is going over their presentation, as there will be a chance to take a post-shadowing assessment to verify your virtual shadowing hours. More information will be available on this at the end of the session, so stay tuned. Lastly, if you can, we request that you turn your cameras on. This is by no means an obligation as we are respectful of different circumstances, but it does help us feel closer together in a time when socially distancing is mandatory. We also request that you make sure to mute yourself as this will ensure the professional has complete and full attention from the audience. I appreciate you for listening. And now I would like to welcome our professional. Thank you so much for joining us today. You can go ahead and share your screen whenever you're ready. All right, good afternoon or good morning to some of you on the call today. Uh, my name is Meryl Alapatu. I am a doctor of physical therapy and PhD researcher at the University of Florida. I'm a research assistant professor um, here at UF. So go Gators. Thank you to the pre-health pre shadowing program for inviting me here to give you a glimpse of my life as a physical therapist in academia and um, give you a glimpse of physical therapy as a profession in general. I hope that uh, this information is useful and definitely feel free to um, drop any questions that you come to mind in the chat. So just to give you a little bit of background about me, my education and training, I got my bachelor's um, in exercise science from Indiana University back in 2005. And then I went right into physical therapy school to a doctor of physical therapy uh, training program at the University of Florida. That was a three-year program. After that, I worked for, um, or I, I went right into a physical therapy residency. So after I graduated in May, in July, I um, had sat for my boards in June, I passed luckily, and then I began a year long residency in cancer rehabilitation and pelvic health rehabilitation at the University of Florida Health. So still here in uh, Gainesville, Florida. After, during that residency, I'll talk about this in a little bit, I developed some questions, clinical questions that I, that I had that could really only be answered with more advanced research training. So in 2009, after my residency ended, I um, shifted back to part-time work and enrolled full-time in um, the Rehabilitation Science PhD program at the University of Florida. So I did, uh, I was part of a fellowship for a couple of years during my training. I graduated in 2014, um, did a year-long postdoctoral fellowship, and then joined the faculty at in UF's um, physical therapy program in, at, in fall of 2015. So I've been a research assistant professor here in the program since then. And so sort of as the title suggests, my primary track or what I spend most of my time doing here at UF uh, is research. I do a little bit of teaching, which I'll talk about in a little bit, um, but I'm not doing any sort of clinical service right now. I do some consulting on the side, um, but it's not part of my primary assignment here in my faculty position at UF to provide clinical services. So first things first, just because I don't want to assume that everyone knows necessarily what um, a physical therapist is, but the definition of physical therapist, this is, um, this is a definition from the American Physical Therapy Association. Physical therapist is a movement expert who improves quality of life by prescribing exercises, providing hands-on care, and also providing patient education. Physical therapists treat um, the across the entire lifespan, from newborns to people who are at the end of their life as well. There are several different areas 
practice um, within physical therapy. So I think a lot of times uh, when students come into a program like UF, all students are required to have a certain number of observation hours. The vast majority of students have done their observation or volunteer hours in outpatient orthopedics or outpatient clinics or the hospital. Those are really sort of the two most popular areas. So general orthopedic conditions, these are you know, outpatient clinics where you might see patients with issues um, such as musculoskeletal pain, uh, recovery from injuries or surgery. Um, sort of that's kind of your bread and butter outpatient physical therapy. Then there's pelvic health, which is my area of expertise and interest, um, which involve things treating patients that have issues such as pelvic floor dysfunction. Uh, this could be related to pre or postpartum conditions. This could be post-surgically. So one example is men, um, post-prostatectomy uh, for prostate cancer, other prostate issues. Um, women that have pelvic pain or, um, or men that have pelvic pain, urinary incontinence, um, individuals who undergo gender affirmation surgeries would also fall into this realm of pelvic health as well. Uh, another area of PT practice is neurological conditions. So commonly uh, we think of people post-stroke or post-spinal cord injury or traumatic brain injury pediatrics, sports and athletics. Sports and athletics is another one of those sort of typical areas of PT that you think. Um, geriatrics, acute medical conditions. So these might be people in an acute care hospital. Um, cancer rehabilitation is another growing or evolving area of physical therapist practice. And then um, there's also academics. So teaching and or research, which is um, what I'm doing full-time right now. So this is just to give you an idea, there's so much variety in terms of what physical therapy, what areas of um, practice there are for you to work in as physical therapists. Um, and, and there's so many different directions you could take with what you do as a licensed PT. So it's not just, I'm going to be working in an outpatient clinic or working in a hospital. There's just, there's so many different opportunities available. So what are the different types of clinical settings? So we talked already about hospitals and outpatient clinics, home health physical therapy. So actually going into the home of a patient and working with them, if they're unable to, um, they don't qualify or they're not able to get to an outpatient clinic, uh, working in the school system, fit, fitness or wellness facilities, and then nursing homes as well. I think one of the misconceptions about physical therapists is that we only sort of work with people who have had injuries or um, need some type of rehab. But we also work within the larger health and wellness space as well. So people that want to move better or uh, train for, you know, events or certain activities, we work in that well, the health and wellness space as well. So what's the training required to become a PT? And so uh, I guess I should, I, I noticed in the chat box that there's someone from Canada. So physical therapist is the term that is used in the United States to describe everything I'm talking about here, physical therapists. The rest of the world uses the term physio therapist or physiotherapy. And so um, physiotherapy, physiotherapist are synonymous with physical therapist and physical therapy. Uh, so I just want to make sure that's clear. What I'm talking about today is specific to training in the United States. So if you are from a different part of the world, the training that is required to be a physical therapist where you live might be different than what's required here in the United States. So I just want to put that out there as well. So a bachelor's degree is required, depending on how quickly or long you take with this, roughly around four years. And then um, a doctor of physical therapy degree from an accredited program, depending on which program that is. Usually most programs are anywhere from two and a half to a maximum of three years long. Next, you have to pass the national licensure exam. And so these are the three main things, bachelor's degree, four years bachelor's degree, three years DPT degree. We're talking about seven years of, um, of 
undergrad postgraduate training total, and then passing the national licensure exam. So that is what enables you to practice as a physical therapist. Those are your basic requirements. All physical therapists graduate as generalists. So that means basically when you graduate from PT school, you should be able to be placed into a hospital or go to an outpatient clinic and have a patient come in front of you. And at the very least, you should be able to evaluate and come up with a basic treatment plan for that patient. Some people go and some people work as generalists or work in one particular setting for their entire career. And that's, you know, completely fine. Many other people um, choose to enroll in physical therapist residencies or fellowships after their entry level or initial DPT training. This is what I chose to do. I was really interested in pelvic health and cancer rehabilitation. And there just happened to be a residency here at UF Health. I knew that I wanted to sort of maintain a link with the academic environment because I was still, I was interested in research um, while I was doing my clinical work. And so the residency seemed like a good fit for me and it was, you know, at that time. And so if people wanna specialize in a particular area, a residency or a fellowship may be a route to go. And, you know, those different specialty practice areas that I listed on an earlier slide, many of those, almost all of those actually have accredited um, residencies and some have fellowships associated with them as well. So again, if specialty practice or a specialty area is what you want to practice in, there are opportunities for growth and development in that as well. So how did I get here? Okay, so I told you about my education and training. So right after I graduated from PT school, I worked, did my residency at the UF Health Cancer Rehab Clinic. And so I was really fortunate. This was a brand new clinic, brand new program. And so as a new graduate, I was able to help develop three primary rehab programs programs within this cancer rehab setting. So we had our general outpatient cancer rehab program, lymphedema management, and then post-prostatectomy and pelvic health. And this last area here, post-prostatectomy and pelvic health in particular, is really where I started to get um, develop more of those questions related to uh, pelvic floor dysfunction in women and pelvic pain and why some people seem to do really well with physical therapist uh, delivered interventions or treatment and some people didn't do as well. Um, and so the other thing that we instituted in this clinic um, was systematic uh, collection of patient outcomes. So we administered questionnaires to patients at regular intervals throughout their, um, throughout their care in our clinic. And we were actually able to quantitatively assess how well our patients did with, our, with the physical therapy services that we provided. These are just uh, the different members of my um, clinical team, my mentors, I guess I would, I would consider them and friends that I worked with um, in the clinic and during residency training. Um, because I was part of that residency program and I had that link with the academic department, the academic, the physical therapy department at the University of Florida, I was also able to participate in research during my residency, which sort of fueled my research fire a little bit more. And so these are some of the questions that I developed and was able to actually get um, a publication out of, uh, was, published it after the residency, but we began collecting this data as part of the outcomes that we collected with our patients. And so these are just some of the outcomes you can see. I mean, if you, you all can look this paper up. I think it's available publicly if you're very interested to see um, what we found. So with residency training and why I think residency, for me, why residency training as a physical therapist was important. I, I learned during that time period how to collaborate and coordinate with other healthcare providers. And that was partly because of the setting that I was in. And this, we were, you know, we were housed in a radiation oncology department. Our outpatient physical therapy clinic was housed in this outpatient um, radiation oncology department. So we, every single day, we were interacting with radiation oncologists, the um, technicians, the physicists, social work, nutrition, all these other different healthcare providers that are in, are already involved in the care of these patients that are undergoing radiation therapy for cancer. And now we were this new 
not new, but uh, new to the clinic or new to this, this, um, this outpatient radiation oncology clinic, new profession that was part of the healthcare team. And so that's a really, I think a unique opportunity that I had during the residency that most people probably don't get, especially coming right out right after school. And so being able to educate these other healthcare providers and what physical therapists do, what I do, um, what value, what impact, we as physical therapists have on these patients as they're undergoing radiation therapy for cancer, uh, I think was really impactful and really, really powerful and taught me a lot about working with other healthcare providers. This also of course led to the development of more questions. And so, you know, again, working with people who had pelvic floor dysfunction and pelvic pain, these are some of the questions that, um, you know, I, had developed during that year long residency period. I worked, I contacted some of my faculty members um, at the university, my DPT faculty members at the University of Florida. And they said, you know, we have this PhD program in rehab science. Um, why don't you look into it? And, you know, if this is something that you're interested in doing, consider enrolling into this program. And of course, you know, I naively thought I was going to answer all of these questions in a four year PhD, which was, um, you know, I had every intention of doing, but didn't realize how ambitious this was. So my PhD training then um, was also at the University of Florida. And my interest was uh, looking at the mechanisms, the, psych the psychological mechanisms underpinning or underlying pelvic pain in women. So sort of funny, all my um, advisors for my PhD were all the all two physical therapists and two clinical psychologists, but my, my all men, so my clinical team, my clinical mentoring team was all women and my PhD or research mentoring team was all men. So I think the, the mix of those two was, was pretty interesting. So as a PhD student, um, one key, key takeaway that I will uh, give you all, if you are interested in pursuing your PhD at any point down the road, you definitely want to try to get to a program where funding is provided to you. You should really try your hardest not to get into debt in order to get your PhD. Um, and so I was able to do that here at the University of Florida. Um, my first two years, I was a teaching assistant in the DPT program. So this program that I graduated in, I got to come back and teach PT students all the information uh, that I learned, you know, three or four years beforehand. Um, after that two-year teaching assistant assistantship, I enrolled into or selected to be part of a, a pre-doctoral fellowship. So this provided an additional two and a half years of funding. Um, which paid my tuition and fees and also provided me an annual stipend. I also applied for a number of um, external scholarships as well. So depending on what uh, profession that you're in, so physical therapy, we have an organization called the Foundation for Physical Therapy Research, which supports people that are interested um, in pursuing research careers or research projects within physical therapy. And so I was able to apply for and receive uh, several different scholarships from this organization, which helped offset um, the costs of uh, my PhD training. And then again, professional organization, the American Physical Therapy Association, the Academy of Pelvic Health Physical Therapy, of which I was a member, um, I received funding for them from them as well. So all of these things I think are just are really important there. You know, the, the reason with sharing this is sometimes the cost of higher education, particularly graduate training, can be really daunting. And there are so many opportunities for um, financial support that people are just not aware of, that are not advertised very well. And so finding people that you can sort of go to as mentors or you know, people that you can go to for advice with, within whichever uh, profession you decide to go into, these are people that can help navigate you to towards these different towards these different resources, um, particularly when it comes to financial support. Um, and so this was the primary question that I landed on for my PhD training. Again, very interested in psychological factors and how they influence pelvic pain. And my big picture question was, okay, well then 
how do physical therapists, what, what role do the interventions that physical therapists um, administer um, to patients, what role do those play in, do these affect these psychological factors at all? Do, are the treatments that we provide only impacting the musculoskeletal system? And then, you know, I was also really interested in the fear avoidance model of pain and how this is relevant to pelvic pain. So I won't bore you with all of the details about my uh, dissertation, but these are some of the specific questions. How do emotional and psychological factors contribute to pain sensitivity in women with pelvic pain? And then how do women with pelvic pain compare to healthy women uh, when it comes to how they respond to questions related to their emotional and psychological state? And then also when it comes to um, pain sensitivity testing as well. So the four members of my, of my research advisory committee that you saw earlier, in addition to Emily Weber and Nash Moad, who are two um, gynecologists here at the University of Florida, comprise my um, dissertation committee. So I graduated in 2015. For a lot of people that are interested in research careers like I am, it's recommended after your PhD that you do uh, some sort of postdoctoral training. So postdoctoral training is really just sort of that transition time between being a PhD student and a full-time faculty member where you work under the mentorship of a more senior um, advisor person. Um, you write grants, you write papers, it's sort of that time for you to sort of be selfish and figure out what to um, career-wise? And are you prepping to enter into academia as a full-time faculty member? Are you looking to maybe go into industry, work for, you know, a major device company or pharmaceutical company? What direction do you want to take here? So I did my um, postdoctoral fellowship at the UF Pain Research and Intervention Center of Excellence, and again, also focusing on chronic and musculoskeletal pain with the focus in female pelvic pain, and worked under the mentorship of uh, clinical psychologist, Dr. Michael Robinson. <clears throat> so after that is when I joined UF's DPT program as a full-time faculty member. So for any faculty, if you're, if you're in a primary faculty position, you have three primary aspects of your job. And I think this is safe to say for most faculty at any institution, you're gonna be evaluated annually on your research and or scholarly uh, contributions, your teaching, and then also whatever service you do. So for me, research is how many papers am I getting out per year or am I publishing per year? How many grants am I submitting per year? And, how, and ideally how many grants am I having funded per year? Uh, teaching, how many courses am I teaching? What do my teaching evaluations look like from students? Excuse me, and then service, you know, how many, what committees or task forces do I serve on within my department, within the larger college level, or within the much broader uh, university level as well. So these are the three things as a faculty member that I'm evaluated on. And again, our program here at the University of Florida is a little bit different because our clinical services, our clinical physical therapy services are completely separate from the academic services. And I'm on the academic side, so I don't have any sort of clinical um, appointment or expectations as part of my role. So these are just some of my ongoing research projects with some of my colleagues from the um, Cancer Rehab Clinic, uh, just right straight looking at early detection and management of lymphedema in people with breast cancer. Um, pelvic pain, again, is something that I'm very passionate about. And so endometriosis is a type of pelvic pain. And so this is just a study looking to see if we can identify um, what things predict successful outcomes versus failure in conservative management for endometriosis. Um, and these final two projects are two projects that are funded right now with, um, with grants. And so looking at pain modulation in people with fibromyalgia 
And then this last one, this is sort of a newer uh, emerging practice area in physical therapy is um, rehabilitation following gender affirmation surgeries. And so what we're interested in with this project is what sorts of musculoskeletal pain and sexual pain and dysfunction do people experience following gender affirmation surgeries? Because um, this information is just not out there, but uh, more and more of these surgeries and procedures are being done annually. And many of these people are showing up to physical therapy clinics and physical therapists are sort of learning as they go in terms of what are the issues that these patients are coming in with. And so we want to evaluate this uh, more systematically and see if we can get a better handle on gaps in the healthcare system and what we as rehab providers can be doing better to improve the quality of care that these patients are getting. So I do do a bit of teaching as well. Um, so I'm the primary instructor in our DPT program for a course called Professional Issues One. Uh, this is the course that I tell students is this is going to keep you from failing your clinical internship or uh, getting fired from your job. And then um, because of my research background, I also am a co-instructor for evidence-based practice two and three, which is where we teach our students how to evaluate and read the scientific literature and how to use the scientific literature for clinical decision-making. I also do a module in pelvic health rehab, pelvic health physical therapy in our musculoskeletal practice class. And then I also um, am an advisor or mentor for um, anywhere from five to six DPT students in, in a given year. Service. So I do, everyone has service that they have to do. So at the department level, I'm on my um, professionalism committee for my department. And then I'm co-chair of our inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility committee as well. I chair the uh, seminar committee, the rehab science seminar committee for our college. And then professionally, I serve on the board of directors for the Florida Physical Therapy Association, which is our um, Florida component of the, of the American Physical Therapy Association. And then I'm also a board member on the International Pelvic Pate Society as well. So I do do some service outside of my job at UF. So what does a typical day look like for me? Um, this is a great picture I just snapped a few minutes ago. I spend, uh, I spend a lot of time in front of a computer um, as a faculty member. So I'm writing papers or writing grants or communicating you know, with um, colleagues or students via email. Um, right now we're doing a lot of uh, virtual teaching, uh, but otherwise I'd be in a classroom once, once a week for the most part uh, for the semesters that I teach. Um, and then a lot of meetings. So faculty meetings, committees, task forces, um, grant meetings, collaborator meetings. Um, so I spend a lot of time in, in front of the computer and in my office. So what do I like, dislike most about my job? Okay, so I really like the fact um, that academia is very flexible. I do not have to be sitting at my desk from eight to five or nine to five and you know check in and out or any anything like that. I don't have to you know be at the clinic at eight a.m. work till twelve till my lunch break seeing patients and I get thirty minutes and then spend the rest of my afternoon seeing patients as well. So it's very flexible. If I have to, if I want to go for a run at lunchtime or at 1130, whatever, I can pick up and do that. If I need to make a doctor's appointment, I can put in for sick leave, but I'm, I'm doing that on my own. It's very flexible in that sense, which I think is great. But one of the things um, that is not as great about academia, particularly, you know, you know, if I go back to what I just said about me working in front of the computer the entire time, it's a little bit isolating, right? You know, I'm just sitting there, it's pretty much me, myself, and I um, having conversations with uh, my collaborators or with students. And so just that human interaction that I would get if I was a practicing in the clinic physical therapist is not the same as in academia. And so that's, you know, I would say the one thing that human interaction um, that I used to get in the clinic working with patients is definitely um, not, not quite there as much. 
So how do I maintain my work-life balance? Um, I think one of the important things that I've learned is how to say no. People and in institutions and organizations love eager early professionals that are very enthusiastic. And I think it's, you know, there are lots of different things, um, you know, with which you might be inter in, in which you might be interested in, but I think you really have to learn to ask yourself, and I think this is a lesson that comes over time, is doing this volunteer work something that I really enjoy? Is this going to help me achieve my professional, personal, whatever goals in two years, five years, 10 years, um, any sort of volunteer service that you do, like the board service that I was talking about earlier with the Florida Physical Therapy Association and Pelvic Pain Society, those aren't paid. So that's in addition to what I do with my full-time job here at UF. And so, you, you know, I think it's perfectly fine to be picky and choosy about the things that you want to um, spend your time working on outside of, of your full-time job. And that goes, that's the same thing for um, if you were, if I was working in the clinic as well, clinics, hospital systems all have committees, works, work groups, task forces that they need people to be a part of. And so just, I would say, be picky about what you want to do and spend your time doing. So what does typical compensation look like for <clears throat> a physical therapist? So the average salary of a PT working in the clinic is around $85,000 in the United States. Annual salary. This does vary quite a bit depending on the setting that you're working in and also the location of the country. Um, so there are certain settings that are known to pay more because they might not be considered as desirable. Um, from a work standpoint. So these would include things like um, travel physical therapy, where you're going from you know, place to place, maybe it's out of state, maybe it's in a different part of the state that you live in and working there for a set period of time. Um, but because you don't have a home base, you're compensated more. Um, skilled nursing facilities, people tend to make pretty good money and then home health physical therapy as well. But again, um, those are, clinics or settings where you might not have a ton of mentoring one-on-one -on -one time um, with other healthcare providers or with people that could sort of teach you the ropes uh, about what you're doing as a physical therapist. But it's sort of the, it's, it's a choice that many people make when it comes to their loans, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, in academia, there are tenure track positions versus non-tenure track. So I'm in a non-tenure track, I'm in a research track position. Um, if you decide to go into administration, if you are, you know, take on a director uh, role within academia, that could come with the salary bump. Um, private institutions tend to pay better than public institutions. And then obviously um, location of the country or lo location within the country, um, is also taken into account with compensation as well. So is this fair and adequate? You know, it sort of depends. Um, we'll talk, I think it's on the next slide, the sort of the cost breakdown of getting a PT degree. And so this is, I think this is really great that you are all attending this talk now. If you're considering going into PT, you really want a, bet, a good idea before applying to schools, what the total costs are of going to a particular program. And so there was a study done in, published in 2018, so not that long ago, that looked at the net present value of a, a career in physical therapy. And so net present value is a term that they use to uh, describe the costs and benefits of um, becoming a licensed physical therapist because based on your, the training that you receive. And so the net present value, so if, you, if you're graduating with total debt of 150K, the value of being a physical therapist is lower compared to all careers, other health careers, except for chiropract chiropractic and veterinary medicine. If you are graduating with over $200,000 in student loan debt, you may not meet the repayment benchmarks, meaning 
the amount of debt that you take on is going to be far more than you are going to be making as a licensed physical therapist in terms of what your uh, typical compensation or salary is for a physical therapist. And then at debts um, greater than 260,000, your physical therapy degree is equivalent to that of a bachelor's degree, uh, the value of your degree. And so this isn't necessarily to scare people off or to suggest that you should not go into physical therapy. But the best advice that I can give you is, you know, physical therapy is different than other professions like medicine, med, med school, for example. Um, no one is, uh, no one is looking at physical therapists and saying, oh, this physical therapist went to University of Florida, whereas this first physical therapist went to University of Georgia, you know, which of these sounds better. It's not like the, the comparison that, you know, people, there's a lot of prestige, I think, associated with where you go to medical school, that same level of prestige with PT school does not exist. And that's just the reality of it. So my advice is choose an in-state program that is going to save you in-state, that's the state that you live in, obviously, if there are in-state programs um, available there and apply for scholarships, which you, the only things that people care about when they are hiring you, three things. Number one, did you graduate from a CAPD accredited program? That's the accrediting body that accredits all physical therapist programs, educational programs. That's number one. Number two, did you pass the national licensure exam? And number three, are you someone that they want to work with? Do you give off good vibes in the interview? Do you get along well with people? Are you personable, et cetera, et cetera. And so those are the three things. No one, no one, no one's going to choose you over another person because you went to a more prestigious or expensive PT school. So for physical therapists, getting, hu getting into huge amounts of debt to graduate from a so-called prestigious program is not worth it. Minimize the amount of debt that you can take on and um, by, by going to in-state, an in-state program if possible, and then also applying for scholarships and really looking to see, you know, what, what, how much money do I need to take out for, for PT school on an annual basis? Don't just take out whatever you can take out because the government allows you to take out the maximum really take a look at your budget, what your costs are going to be. And, you know, I, I, I say this to my students in the first year of the program and they, every single year they say, I wish I'd gotten this information when I started looking at PT schools, because I didn't even think about debt or what I should be thinking about or asking programs in terms of tuition and fees, et cetera, et cetera. So I just, you know, I think this is such an important question um, that you should be asking yourselves and um, the finances surrounding choosing a graduate school are so important. So where do I see myself in 10 years? Um, so I would say, you know, I definitely want to continue on the research track that I'm on, being an independent investigator running a research lab. Uh, I want to continue uh, the volunteer service that I provide to the profession, with whether it's board service or committee task forces, whatever it might be. I really enjoy that. Um, I really enjoy that part of being a physical therapist. And then I'm a big... Um, pit bull advocate rescuer. So I'll probably still be doing that in 10 years as well. So avoiding burnout, I think this is a big, you know, question as well, just a topic to think about, you know, think about what you can handle. And this goes back to being picky and choosy about what you select, um, what you choose to spend your time doing, being okay with turning down people and organizations. And a lot of this might be more specific to you all as you, after you get into a program, um, and then, you know, towards the end of that, that program or, you know, in the middle of that program when you're being asked to, you know, do X, Y, and Z or participate in these opportunities, um, you really need to think about how much time, effort, and bandwidth is this volunteer work going to take <clears throat> and at what expense? What are you not going to be doing because you're spending time with this volunteer service? I think it's really important. Um, Prior to PT school or whatever program you go into, 
take a vacation. Don't spend your month or two months before entering into a grad program studying or prepping any information that you need for a graduate program, you're going to get once you get in the program. So after you graduate from undergrad, take a little break and just relax and enjoy, take a vacation, um, go visit friends, you know, whatever it might be. Uh, don't, don't get yourself burned out before even starting your program. All right, so that concludes my portion. And I'm happy to answer questions. So I have been compiling um, a list of questions that were asked in the chat, but I would love to invite our students here today to go ahead and ask their own question. So if you would like to ask your question directly, please use the raise hand function and I will call on you. Um, if you prefer to drop your question in the chat and have me ask it, I'm happy to do that as well. Um, so since we have no takers yet, I will go ahead and ask a few from the chat and just feel free to use the raise hand function if you decide you'd like to. So one of our students asked, are there any specific undergraduate majors that you feel are more helpful in gaining a physical therapy degree? Uh, that's a great question. So I think you would think that, you know, exercise science or one of these health science based ones would be more helpful, but not necessarily. Really, the most important thing is that all physical therapy programs have prerequisite courses that um, you're required to complete before you can enroll into their program. So, you know, we have students that come from a variety of different backgrounds. Some of them are, you know, pre-health or exercise science. Others are psychology, we've had biology, um, anthropology. We've had people that have gone off and worked for several years before deciding they wanna come back to PT school. So really a wide variety of um, different backgrounds, but the most important thing is those um, prerequisite courses. Awesome, that's definitely good to hear. I think people can get very wrapped up in what major they choose, but I love that advice, just kind of taking the time to explore and making sure you're getting those prereqs out of the way. Mm -hmm. um, another question that we have uh, is, are there any other healthcare professions that you seriously considered aside from physical therapy? And what made you ultimately decide physical therapy was for you? That's a really good question. Um, you know, I wish I could say I had this big aha moment. This is, you know, I had this injury and I just had this great experience with physical therapy, but if I'm going to be completely honest, I partied way too hard at Indiana my freshman year and I was a business major and I think I got a C on my first accounting exam. And it just, you know, I really decided that wasn't the route for me. And I was talking to my dad and he said, you know, you volunteered at that, um, it was an athletic clinic or it was some sports clinic during high school. He said, you, he said, you like that. And so why don't, you know, what if that's something that you want to go into? And so I sort of just decided on a whim to switch majors. I started volunteering at a local PT clinic in Bloomington, Indiana, and decided that I really liked it and found out what the prereqs um, were going to be required for the different programs that I had looked into. So it was really sort of a random decision uh, that did, I, I wish I could say a ton of thought went into it, but it didn't. But it was really good because um, number one, like I talked about at the beginning of the presentation, there's so many different options within physical therapy that I could have gone and that if I wanted to, I could still go into. So I think that was great for me. Um, I did not end up having to take out, you know, a ton of debt for PT school. Um, back in 2005, I think I paid out, out of state tuition for a year. And then I was able to apply for residency in the state of Florida, um, you know, for my second and third year. And so from the sort of debt to income ratio, mine wasn't huge, which I think is, you know, another, you know, plus as well. So I'd say all in all, I'm really happy with, you know, how it turned out. It's sort of a, for me, non-conventional route as a physical therapist going into academia full-time and being a researcher, but um, I get to collaborate with um, ob gynes, clinical and health psychologists, chiropractors, occupational therapists, plastic surgeons. I mean, there's just, there's so many different opportunities that I have um, access to, which I think is great. 
On that same vein, um, could you speak to kind of like the collaboration and like the medical team that's involved in physical therapy? Yeah, so physical therapists, um, so my area that I work primarily in is chronic and musculoskeletal pain. So best practice for any sort of person that has, you know, persistent pain is not just, it's not just physical therapy, you know, so there might be a whole host of people that are involved in the care of people with um, persistent pain. So people with um, pelvic pain is what, you know, I sort of specialize in. And so our healthcare team, you know, might be a physical therapist, um, pain medicine, gynecologist, primary care physician, um, sexual therapist or counselor, clinical health psychologist, diet, dietitian or nutrition. Um, these are just a sort of sampling of the people that are involved and that we collaborate with pretty regularly. Some of it's dependent on the area of practice, you know, that you go into. If you work in a lot of sports, and orthopedics, you might collaborate more closely with um, PM&R physicians, orthopedic um, surgeons, etc. Um, it just it really depends on the on the different settings and different practice areas. Awesome, that's so interesting. Um, I love hearing about kind of how healthcare professions can really intertwine sometimes and really support each other. Yep. Um, we have another question that was asked in the chat. Um, just regarding how you talked about the benefit of going to school in state um, for financial reasons, but do you think that there's any benefit to being able to kind of network and getting experience in a different location where you would maybe eventually like to live? Absolutely. And so this is a question, if you are going to be looking at different PT programs, one of the questions to ask um, of the program when you're, when, you know, if you're visiting the program or emailing the program director coordinator is to ask about the opportunity for completing your full-time clinical internships out of state or in a different part of the country. So for example, our students in our PET program, we have sites, um, clinical sites set up for them to complete their full-time um, internships or clinical affiliations. I think in almost every state in, um, in the US. And so most programs, or a lot of, I shouldn't say most, a lot of programs operate in that way where they have um, different clinical sites set up where their students can go and complete full-time affiliations outside of the um, town or immediate area that the program's in. So that's one option. The other option is that there are, um, there's, there's a couple different um, physical student physical therapist organizations that are large and active and that meet regularly throughout the year. They have a big presence at the annual conference, the uh, American Physical Therapy Association annual conference. These are great ways to network as well and meet people in different parts of the country. Um, and I, and I, think, I think the networking at those types of meetings is probably more powerful than even, you know, completing a clinical affiliation in a different um, state or different part of the country. Awesome, that's really great to hear. I know networking is super important, especially now. Um, so many opportunities have kind of been closed down and are just now opening up. So it's definitely important yep. to kind of spread your wings and talk to whoever you can. Um, another question that we have is, do you have like a favorite memory from physical therapy or PhD school? Hmm. I'm trying to think. I think it was just, you know, I developed, I, some of my best friends in the world are people that I met during PT, it's my closest friends in the world right now are people that I've met during PT school that, you know, you, there are these people that you, you're gonna be spending every day for, you know, two plus years with them. Um, you know, when you're there in school, you're in class all day together, you develop this, these really close um, relationships and friendships. And so I think for me, it was developing those relationships. These are people that have gone on, you know, they've left Florida, they might live in different parts of the country or the world right now. And so, you know, that's another opportunity for networking and just sort of exposing me to people that are not necessarily in the same um, 
work environment that that I'm in here in academia. So I'd say I'd say the people that I met along the way are my favorite memory. That's awesome. Um, another question is just, is there like a most interesting case um, that you had during your training that you could share with us? Yeah, let me see. I've had a few. I would say the one that um, was probably the most interesting was a woman that I was seeing for pelvic pain. She had cervical cancer and she came to see us for, um, she was having pain during sexual intercourse with her husband. And we were treating her, treating her using dilators, manual therapy, exercise. This actually I ended up publishing this case. And at the end of the day, everything improved except for her sexual function. And come to find out at the end of therapy that her sexual function had not improved. And this was based on the questionnaire that she had um, completed for us, but it hadn't improved because her husband, right around the time that she started physical therapy with me, was diagnosed um, with erectile dysfunction. So for me, it was an aha moment because it really forced me to think about not just the care, this tunnel vision of care that I'm providing as a physical therapist, but what is the whole picture of what's going on with my patient? I hadn't even considered this whole other aspect of her life, which is, which is very relevant to her sexual function, her partner, but I hadn't even thought to ask about that. And so, you know, that case for me was very eye-opening because um, it's really easy to sort of become very narrow in your viewpoint of what you're thinking about as a particular healthcare professional for me as a physical therapist. But if I really wanted to be um, an effective member of the healthcare team, I had to think and look at my, my patients more holistically. And for, for me, that particular patient and her outcomes were a big aha moment for me. And really what, um, what led me to think more collaborating with all these, with all these different um, other healthcare providers in my research as well. Yeah, that's so interesting. Definitely like a lot of aspects of your life can really affect a certain condition you're having. And I think that's something that I can say I've heard is kind of a common thread in these virtual shadowing sessions that I've attended is just the importance of looking at the whole picture and kind of getting to know your patient outside of their specific symptoms. Um, another question we have in the chat is, is there anything that you wish that you had done differently while you were in PT school? Um, I think I would have, the one thing that I would have done differently is I would have asked more questions. I think I was very, you know, the thing that people, any, any health, most, you know, healthcare um, graduate programs, you're taking students who at undergrad are at, you know, this, if we think about the um, a bell curve, you are all at the rightmost end of this bell curve, right? You're probably high achieving, have decent grades, test scores, et cetera. You're probably at the higher end of your class. Then you enroll into a program with many other people who are just like you. So you're not the, when you look at the bell curve, you're no longer at that skewed at that right end of the bell curve, you're average. You're with everyone else who's just like you. And so I think to have that mentality that it's okay to be average, it's okay not to understand information the first time that it's given to you, that it's okay to go to your professor's office hours and ask questions that, you were maybe too embarrassed to ask in class. I mean, that's what I wish I really spent a lot more time doing. I joked with one of my um, research mentors about this. It wasn't until I was a teaching assistant as a PhD student in the PT program, um, you know, after I graduated with my PT degree that I came back and was re-listening to these many of these lectures again, where it was like, oh my gosh, this biomechanical, topic now makes so much more sense to me. Like, it's like I did, it didn't click for me when I was in PT school. And I think if I had just asked the questions then before, um, I would have been much better off. And so that's just something that I wish I, I unnecessarily struggled because I had this complex when I came in 
that I should know way more than I did. If I knew, if I, if I needed, if I knew way more than I did, then I wouldn't have to go to PT school. You wouldn't have to go to med school. You don't have to go to any of these different programs. You're there to learn. You're not there um, expected to, you know, know everything going into it. And so just don't be afraid to ask to be that person that asks questions and, um, you know, get to know your, your faculty members, show them that you're interested, that you're genuinely, um, genuinely care about learning. That is such fantastic advice. I think I can speak for a lot of free health students that it's a very competitive environment and people really can be, you know, nervous to show that they don't know everything when in reality, everyone sitting in that lecture hall probably has the same question. So I agree, it's very important to ask questions. Um, Another question we have is if you have any experience in this, um, do you know what it's like to try to work overseas if you have a United States PT degree? Do you know if there's, you know, how you can move out of the US with that degree? So I don't have any personal experience with that. So I could not tell you. Um, there are, there's one Facebook group, it's called the Doctor of Physical Therapy Students, if you're interested. Um, I think that question has come up in that group. Um, I know that there are people who have gotten their license in the States and then, you know, have been, um, they or their partner spouse have been, you know, transferred overseas for whatever reason. So I know it's possible. I just personally don't know the, the actual logistics of that. Awesome. Yeah, I'll drop that, um, the name of that Facebook group in the chat. So for anybody who wants to look into that, feel free to check it out. It's a general, it's, a, it's actually a pretty good group, just people, good discussions and things like that. Um, yeah, you might search for that topic in there. Yeah, awesome. Especially I feel like in this kind of like new technological realm that we're living in, where everyone's connecting online, these Facebook groups can definitely be super helpful to get your questions answered. Yep. Um, Another question that I had was, do you have any like thoughts on how physical therapy might change in the future? Like, what do you see up and coming for the profession? Um, I think one of the things that's really, um, COVID has really forced us to be, to pivot and um, be responsive to is telehealth. And I think that is something that we're going to be seeing um, a lot more of with physical therapy. Um, do you actually need to lay your hands on a patient in order for that patient to have positive outcomes? I think that is a question. It's a sort of a hotly debated question, but I think it's one that remains to be seen. But I think that's one of the, in terms of practice, that's a big area that is, um, is here and it's, it's definitely growing for PT. Yeah, that's super cool to hear. In all honesty, physical therapy was not one of the professions that I necessarily would have thought could do telehealth mm -hmm. just because I've, I've been to physical therapy a little bit and it's just, it's very hands-on, but that's right. so interesting that we really have been forced to expand and really change the way we can do this. So that's super interesting to hear. Yep. I'll definitely kind of look forward to seeing like telehealth, physical therapy in the future. It's super interesting. Um, Another question that I had was, do you um, have any insight into kind of like biases in the physical therapy profession and how do you feel like these can be addressed? Biases in what sense? Like, um, you know, especially working in pelvic health and with a lot of women, maybe like, you know, sexual, um, sexist like insights um you know how that can affect a patient's outcomes or maybe how a health professional would treat a woman compared to a man yeah so i think there are definitely some um there are definitely biases you know in healthcare towards where women are on the receiving end of not maybe getting as, as good or as comprehensive of, of care compared to men. Um, you know, as a pelvic health physical therapist, the idea of even talking about sex or genitalia is still very taboo in our society. You know, even in PT school, for example, we, in our musculoskeletal practice class, we went from, we learned about the ankle, the knee, the hip, low back, shoulder, elbow, and hand, and then wrist and hand. And then we had a completely separate 
lecture on abdominal pelvic health out of, outside of our musculoskeletal practice class. And so, you know, one of my one of my goals is to sort of get people thinking about pelvic health. The pelvis is just and the pelvic floor muscles. It's just tissue. They're just they're just they're like any other muscles of the body, any other part of the body. And so removing this whole notion that the pelvis is sort of this secretive, we don't talk about this, you know, it's the only people that talk about our gynecologists or OBs or urologists, but really sort of expanding that um, conversation around pelvic health. Um, you know, I think in terms of another aspect about pelvic health is pre and postpartum care in terms of, you know, preparing women for some of the common issues that occur after childbirth, um, pelvic organ prolapse, incontinence, pelvic pain, C-section scar pain or episiotomy or tearing or perineal tear pain. We do a really crappy job in general in healthcare of preparing women for you know, that. And so I think that's another area that I think PTs have the potential to, you know, to do better in or be involved in. Um, and then, you know, working with individuals who have gone gender, uh, undergone or are undergoing gender affirmation surgeries, these individuals um, receive care that's been described, you know, at the margins of society. And so that is another patient population that I think is heavily biased against, and that we as healthcare providers um, have a huge gap to fill in terms of the quality, the type and the amount of care that these individuals receive as well. That's very interesting. Um, just a lot of, you know, things to address in the future. And I hope that some of us may be watching even um, our people who are going to look into, you know, addressing those issues in the future. I hope uh, so. I see that we have a student with their hand raised. So Grace, if you would like to ask your question, go ahead. Hi, yeah, sorry, I came in late. Um, so apologies if you've already answered this, but um, I had two questions. The first one is how and when did you decide what your specialty was gonna be? Um, so I went to a um, that lecture that I told you about that was separate from the musculoskeletal lecture on pelvic health. Um, it was a 730 conference and this woman, this physical therapist was talking about manual physical therapy or manual therapy for infertility. I mean, it sounded fascinating to me. Now I know it's just complete like I don't want to say it's complete hogwash, but the evidence is really not there to support it. And I wouldn't recommend it. Um, but that's what even got me, that's what even got me the pelvic health physical therapy on my radar. I mean, I didn't even know that physical therapists treated conditions like incontinence or pelvic pain or that kind of thing. Long story short, that therapist stopped working at that particular clinic and ended up taking a position within the UF health academic system. And I ended up being paired with her for my specialty clinical affiliation, with, which was um, pelvic health rehab. And so, you know, for me during those eight weeks, just seeing, seeing how grateful the patients were to be able to have intercourse again, pain-free um, or with minimal pain, um, to not have to wear pads or diapers uh, because they were leaking. I mean, just to see how much their quality of life improved. For me, that was the, wow, this is a really important and underserved patient population that more of us need to be working in. So that's really why I got interested in, in pelvic health. Um, Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Can I ask my other question? Yeah, absolutely. Um, just, um, if you knew anybody who um, was trained abroad as a physical therapist, like how common that is? Yeah, actually, I've got several colleagues who've been trained in places such as Italy, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, and then have come to the States. Um, they have to, I don't know the exact requirements. I know that di there are different requirements. There's a national licensure exam, but then there are also different requirements per state 
um, in which you decide to get licensed. And so there are some states, for example, that have less stringent requirements for licensure um, compared to um, like Florida, I think is pretty strict in terms of um, foreign graduates, in terms of what they will allow or what, um, what requirements they make foreign graduates complete in order to become licensed in Florida. But I don't know the, it, it's largely state dependent, but I know okay, plenty thanks. of people who've done it, yeah. So if I know, I live in New York, if there are a lot of physical therapists in New York that may not have DPT but are working, that's mm -hmm. a good sign, right? Yeah, yeah, and so actually I know, okay. I know a handful of um, internationally trained PTs who have gotten their PT license from New York, for example. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Awesome. I love when students ask questions. It's a lot more fun than hearing myself talk. So again, if you have a question, please feel free to raise your hand um, and make it a little more interactive here. Um, I'll go ahead and ask another question that we had in the chat. Um, so do you often, um, you kind of touched on this a little bit, but do you often work with women who have just had children? Um, and you know, what are some ways that you can help them? Yeah, so um, women who've had just had children are, um, so complications or, or musculoskeletal issues post-pregnancy or post-delivery is really common. And so some of the common issues that they have, you know, I mean, so after childbirth and delivery, there's a certain level of natural history, tissue healing that's gonna happen just as your body recovers. But if people are still experiencing things like painful intercourse or um, urinary or fecal incontinence or pain at the side of their C-section or where they had the perineal tear um, or episiotomy, these are things that um, we would work with these patients with. Um, you know, manual therapy is one of the common interventions with, these, with this patient population. Many of these women... Um, didn't exercise or didn't exercise much over the last 10 months. And so getting them back onto an exercise program, what that might look like, um, pelvic floor muscle training for people that have incontinence. Uh, there's a wide variety, diastasis recti is another common um, issue that people have in the uh, postpartum period. And so these are just some of the, um, some of the different types of treatments that physical therapists would do with these patients. Awesome, that's super interesting to hear. Um, another question that we had was how often is it, especially as someone who you know, does research and is looking into things a lot that you come across something unfamiliar or you like have no idea what it is and you have to explore that? Uh, pretty often, I mean, I'm pretty, but I'm also pretty comfortable with saying I have no idea, let me look it up. Um, you know, sometimes there are interesting patient cases that people will bring up to me or, you know, I'll get a random email about from someone that heard me on a podcast or something like this and say, hey, what do you think about this case? Um, so, you know, I think it's common there, you know, but that at the same time, there's, you know, I'm pretty familiar with pelvic pain and incontinence as common condition, but a lot of times patients don't know that these are incredibly common conditions. And so a lot of times they can feel very alone or isolated and not necessarily know that they should or could be talking to their healthcare providers about this issue. And so I think you can sort of look at this um, both ways. But I, I, there, I, I, I learn new things all the time that I had no idea about. Awesome, that's super cool, I feel like especially in healthcare, we're just lifelong learners and we're all like, there's always something more. Um, so it's definitely nice to hear that you're super comfortable with, you know, not knowing what something is and oh, yeah. having to figure it out. Um, you mentioned um, that you've spoken on podcasts before. I'm always looking for new podcast recommendations. So if you have any cool podcasts, um, you know, like what's your favorite? Um, so the ones that I've done are with clinical athlete and barbell medicine. And the most recent one was the E3 rehab podcast. 
I don't listen to a ton of PT type podcasts. It's just, I, I just, I like true crime stuff uh, personally. Um, but those ones, those, those three that I mentioned are all, you know, very good podcasts that I'd recommend. Awesome. I am also a big true crime fan. I love Crime Junkie. I listen to it like every week. <laughs> so that's definitely um, good to hear. Other people don't, some people think I'm crazy sometimes. Like, why do you listen to that when you're driving alone in the car? But <laughs> um, another question we had was, um, you know, going back to residency, like what was a typical week like for you in PT residency? So PT residencies, there are, you know, number one thing that I recommend is that you look for residencies that are accredited. And so accredited by, I believe the organization is the American Board of Residencies and Fellowships in Physical Therapy. It's a it's a, or physical therapy education. It's this really long thing. But anyways, the, 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 the reason that you want an accredited residency is that an accredited residency has gone through this rigorous evaluation to make sure that it's giving you the training that you need to graduate with a certain skill set, education level that this um, accrediting body has approved. Um, and so that might look like what residency should entail is not just clinical care, but also you're getting mentoring as part of your residency. You are getting one-on-one -on -one time with a more experienced physical therapist. You may have opportunities to participate in research. You're getting some sort of didactic um, training in addition to the clinical care that you're providing for your patients. Residency should not just be a way for institutions to pay people less and have you see a lot of patients and then you graduate with this residency certificate. There should be standards um, that they're held to and that's why I absolutely recommend you know, accredited residency. So my residency was not accredited, but it ended up being, it was a 40 hour you know, work week, 32 hours of it were in the clinic, um, working directly with patients or working with my mentor with patients. And then eight hours of it, I had an academic mentor at the University of Florida, the academic PT side where I'm located now. And I worked with that person on um, some of the research projects that I um, talked about earlier in cancer rehab. So I had both a clinical and mentoring component to it and also an academic slash research um, component to it as well. And I did take residence, at least in the UF health system. Um, I think at that time, they were paid 15 or $16,000 less than um, an entry level physical therapist. And so, you know, that's another good question to ask when, if you would decide to apply for a residency program, what do you pay your residents? And, you know, do you pay them a full entry level physical therapist salary or do they take a pay cut because they're in this residency program? Awesome. Yeah, super interesting to hear. I don't know much about residencies. Um, but yeah, I think it's easy to just get really eager mm -hmm. and, you know, be ready to jump into something that maybe, um, isn't necessarily the best scenario for you. Um, it looks like we have another question, um, from a student. So Ellis, if you want to go ahead and ask your question, feel free. Yeah. Thank you. Is there a particular reason why you didn't want to continue to the clinical side of physical therapy? Um, I wouldn't say there was. I, me personally, I don't think, I didn't want to be in the clinic seeing patients for 40 plus 50 hours a week. That just wasn't what I necessarily enjoyed. I think the, that was one aspect of it, but the bigger aspect of it was that I really enjoy doing research and it is really hard to do, be a full-time researcher and conduct studies and lead studies and write papers and write grants while working in a clinic full-time. Um, I think there's maybe a handful of people that do it really, really, literally a handful of people that do it really, really well. Um, and, you know, in order to get into a research track position like I'm in, or if I wanted to get into a tenure track position, I would have to make that decision. Do I want to focus more in research slash academia, or do I want to focus more in clinical practice? So not so much the I hate 
working in the clinic. I hate working with patients, but more so that I really enjoy um, the research that I do. Awesome. Thank you so much for that answer. Um, we are getting close to the end of our session today. So I would love to ask if you just have any last minute advice for us before we end this session. Yeah, I would say, um, you know, do your research in terms of the um, whatever health profession or whatever graduate program you decide to go into. Try to learn about learn about as much of the profession as you can you know follow people on social media whether it's facebook or instagram TikTok. find out about what these different professions look like the different specialty areas within the profession and then once you sort of uh, narrow down you know graduate program or profession that you want to go into do your research on the graduate programs and really make sure that the ones that you are applying to, number one, obviously make sure that they're accredited, that they're quality programs, but do, I really believe it's important to look at what's the value of this education that I'm, that I'm going, this training that I'm going to be getting. How much am I going to be investing in this education, this training program versus how much am I actually going? Cause you're gonna have to repay it back. And that's just the reality of it, right? And so really being able to say, is this program worth it? Knowing what I'm likely to make as a physical therapist, occupational therapist, PA, physician, whatever it might be, is this graduate training program realistic for me to join? Are there ones that are more affordable where I'm not going to be working, you know, like crazy after I graduate to try to pay off all of this debt that I've accumulated. And so I think, you know, being selective and really doing research ahead of time to um, see if you can find an affordable program to where you're, you're going to, you want to enjoy the quality of life that you have after, um, after you graduate, right? You know, I'm definitely one of those people where um, I don't, what's the term work to live versus live to work. I'm more of the work to live. I definitely don't um, live just to work. And so I don't recommend that either. Thank you so much for that final advice. I think we all definitely learned a lot here today. Um, and I really appreciate you coming to speak with us. Um, the next step of our session today will just be a quick wrap up presentation um, about how to get your certificate um, and just, you know, final steps for today. So um, we do invite you to go ahead and log off um, if you wish, um, just because this, this last wrap up presentation, um, you know, it won't be super necessary for you, um, but thank you again. Thank you all. I appreciate it and good luck to all of you. Thank you so much. Take care. All right, everybody. So I know that, you know, getting your certificate is um, super big. So I will go ahead and do our quick wrap up presentation so you can go ahead and take that quiz. Um, considering, um, you know, how much we learned today and that wonderful presentation, we would love you all to just reflect on your session today um, and think about, you know, what brought you to this session what are three major takeaways that you got? And what do you want to learn more about? So this writing um, is not necessarily required, but we do encourage you to submit it to our website for publication, for recognition of your hard work and to enhance your future, enhance your future applications um, to have that publication on there. So if you want to learn more about pre-health shadowing and get involved in our program, we do encourage you to visit our website. You can become an asynchronous volunteer and get certified volunteering hours through so many different um, options like professional nominations, graphic design, social media promotion. We are also accepting team member applications. So if you wanna take on a more active role in PHS to lead projects and initiatives, and even be up here leading sessions with us, then please apply, we would love to have you. Um, once again, uh, we do humbly ask that if you're financially able to donate, that you please consider sending just a few dollars to us via Venmo or PayPal. It costs a lot to keep our program up and running and free to all of you. So if you're someone who can afford to, or if you know someone else who can, Please support those who can't by donating to our organization so everyone can continue to get the education they deserve. 
Otherwise, we simply ask you to spread the word about pre-health shadowing to reach as many students as possible. And now for the part that we've all been waiting for, earning your digital certificate for your virtual shadowing session today. So the first thing that you're gonna do to get this certificate is go onto our website and find our professionals course page. Next, you will take a quick 10 minute, um, 10 question multiple choice quiz based on the content from the session today. You will have 30 minutes per attempt to earn 70% or higher to get that certificate. We know that technology can sometimes be difficult. And for this reason, we allow two attempts to take the assessment. But if you run into any difficulties, please contact us. To ensure that our website does not crash from a high influx of students, we do recommend waiting at least 30 minutes to an hour after the session to take the quiz. And that quiz will be open indefinitely. So even if you don't have time to take it today, you can take it tomorrow, you can take it next month, you can take it whenever. Once you have passed, you can click the finish course button at the bottom of the professionals page and download your certificate that verifies your virtual shadowing hours. If you missed a part of the session today or want to go back and view any other sessions to earn more certificates with verified virtual shadowing hours, you can visit our YouTube channel and watch our previous recordings. You can also find them via the professional pages on our website and take the post shadowing assessments for these as well. Be sure to follow us on social media or subscribe to our email list for the latest updates on upcoming sessions and events. We are currently booked every weekday through June for virtual shadowing sessions, and I hope to see you guys there at every single one. Thank you for joining us today. Um, please stick around if you have any questions. Myself and other team members will be happy to answer them. This session is officially over and I invite you all to log off. Have a wonderful rest of your day.